Hello and welcome to a commemoration of the Apollo 11 lunar landing on its 50th anniversary. The events here recounted took place from July 16th through July 24th, 1969, and let's listen in to how things began in the early morning on July 16th. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control, T minus 2 hours, 40 minutes, 40 seconds, and counting. At this time, the prime crew for Apollo 11 has boarded the high speed elevator from inside the A level in the mobile launcher, which is the second level inside the launcher. This is a high speed elevator, 600 feet per minute, which will carry them to the 320 foot level, uh, the spacecraft level. Uh, shortly, uh, we'll expect astronauts Neil Armstrong and Michael Collins to come across swing arm nine, the Apollo access arm, and proceed to the white room and uh, stand by to board the spacecraft. The third member of the crew, astronaut Edwin Aldrin, who will be the last one to board the spacecraft, will stand by in the elevator, seated in a chair, while his two comrades first board the spacecraft. Once uh, Armstrong, who sits in the left-hand seat, and Collins, who will sit in the right-hand seat uh, during liftoff, are aboard, then Aldrin will be called, and he will uh, take his seat, the middle seat, in the spacecraft. The spacecraft commander, Neil Armstrong, and the command module pilot, Michael Collins now proceeding across the swing arm into the small white room that attaches at the spacecraft uh, level. In the meantime, about 100 feet below, we have a technician, a uh, team of technicians working on a leaking valve, which is a part of the ground support equipment, a part of the system that's used to replenish the fuel supply for the third stage of the Saturn V rocket. He is uh, proceeding to tighten a series of bolts around this valve in the hope that this will correct the leak. Once the technicians do depart, the uh, uh, hydrogen will again be flowed through the system to assure that the leak has been corrected. The uh, spacecraft commander, Neil Armstrong, and CMP, the command module pilot, Mike Collins, now standing by in the white room. T-minus two hours, 38 minutes, 45 seconds and counting. This is launch control. As you heard from the public affairs officer, we are counting down to the launch, and this video and others in this series will present the events properly sequenced so that you can follow along in real time if you choose to do so. If you're watching at some other time, that's fine too, because my goal in the videos is to provide a lot of context and other materials to keep things entertaining and also to inform you while the original audio and sporadic video might not be as engaging like right now. To do this, I will simulate events in two programs, Kerbal Space Program and Reentry and Orbital Simulator, with the former providing the external views and the latter providing the internals. Thanks to Squad for Kerbal and to Wilhelmsen Studios for Reentry. The model of the spacecraft and engines in Kerbal Space Program are from the FASA mod, while the Saturn V tanks are from DECU's Apollo Saturn V mod. An abundance of other modifications help to make the rocket function with a high degree of realism, including real solar system and real fuels. If you want to relive Apollo 11 with just the original footage, audio, and photographs without my commentary or the simulations from the programs, then there is an excellent website with all of it properly sequenced called ApolloInRealTime.org, produced by Ben Feist. Before we get to the launch, there are things that we should discuss that will help you understand what's going on, and I'll present these in short segments in between the audio from the PAO. These would have been known to people watching and listening at the time, some of which was general knowledge, and other details were more the province of space enthusiasts. I want to talk about the basic sources of what you'll hear and see, a bit about what starred us on this journey to the moon, the people involved, and some technical information. The audio that you will be hearing is primarily from the PAO loop, the recording at the public affairs officer's desk. The PAO's job is to explain things to the public, and those who perform that role in the audio do an admirable job of it. The original recording was on tape, and at times when there was expected to be little activity, like when the astronauts were sleeping, they often stopped the recording. This made sequencing the audio a bit tricky, but the PAO tapes are generally in order and easier to follow especially since the PAO regularly states the mission time. The PAO loop features the voice of the PAO, the Apollo 11 astronauts when they're in communication with the ground, and the CAPCOM, the capsule communicator who was an astronaut in mission control, 
who was the only person who would communicate with the astronauts in space to avoid confusion and overlapping voices. Different astronauts fulfilled the Capcom in shifts. We also have tapes from the command module itself from the astronauts in space, but because they could only carry a limited number, they are filled with a lot of snippets that are often out of order, and some recordings were recorded over with what the astronauts deemed was more important material, like their observations of the moon. The command module tapes are mainly important because they capture conversations when the astronauts were not in communication with Mission Control in Houston. The astronauts did send back TV transmissions scattered throughout the mission. Some of these were unscheduled, they were just testing equipment, and some were scheduled, including the entire EVA, the entire spacewalk, on the surface of the moon. We also have the photos and videos the astronauts took, which are generally of higher quality than TV transmissions. So those are the basic sources we will use to recreate what happened 50 years ago during the Apollo 11 mission. Now let's tune back in to the PAO, who is going to update us about mission preparation progress. Apollo Saturn launch control, T minus two hours, 34 minutes, 44 seconds and counting. The spacecraft commander, Neil Armstrong, now aboard the Apollo 11 spacecraft at the 320 foot level at the pad. We had it logged, uh, having the commander go over the sill into the cabin at 6.54 a.m. Eastern Daylight. Since that time, uh, the commander has now been uh, tied into the system and has checked in over the communication lines. He was wished a good morning by the spacecraft test conductor Skip Chauvin, and Armstrong in return said it looks like a good morning. In the meantime, 120 feet below him, the technicians continuing to work to tighten bolts around a leaking valve uh, associated with the system that replenishes hydrogen fuel for the third stage. To repeat once again, this is not a problem on the launch vehicle itself, but on the ground support equipment associated with it. T minus two hours, 33 minutes, 45 seconds and counting. This is Kennedy Launch Control. We'll talk about the space events that led to Apollo 11 in a separate segment after the mission is well underway. For now, I want to introduce the major players in the drama. First is the man who articulated the goal to the public and set the deadline, but didn't live to see the mission carried out, President John F. Kennedy. Kennedy was President of the United States from 1961 until his assassination on November 22, 1963. He represented a new generation, one that lived through the Great Depression and fought in World War II, and did so with uncommon eloquence. He did not, however, enter office as a champion of manned space exploration. On the contrary, he had been opposed to funding it as a senator, and remained so when he ascended to the presidency. That's not to say that he opposed funding for space endeavors in general. He had campaigned on the missile gap, accusing the Eisenhower-Nixon administration of allowing the Soviet Union to take the lead in the development of rocket technology, and he certainly saw both the military and science benefit of a robust program. It was crude space exploration he wasn't sold on. Like the more modest Mercury program, the Apollo program had already been set in motion in the late 1950s by President Eisenhower, but there wasn't funding. And it was going to take a lot of funding. Fortunately, Kennedy's powerful vice president, Lyndon B. Johnson, was an enthusiastic supporter of NASA and an expert at getting Congress to do his bidding. Kennedy wanted to keep Johnson happy, so he didn't pull the plug on NASA's programs just yet. JFK's attitude changed basically overnight when cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin became the first person in space on April 12, 1961, just three months into JFK's presidency. Suddenly, the missile gap had a face, and the political implications of not matching the Soviet Union in crude space flight became apparent. The fact was that people who flew in space would be world heroes, and Gagarin's place in the history books was guaranteed for all time. The United States could not afford to stay out of that game if it wished to convince the world that its political and economic ideology produced better results. More importantly, JFK could try all he might to close the missile gap through military technology, but the public wasn't going to buy it if the Soviets continued to rack up firsts from Sputnik to Luna to Vostok. The United States needed to set the narrative instead of being at the mercy of the compelling story of Soviet space accomplishments, and to declare a goal that the United States could beat the Soviets at. So, on May 25th, just a month after Gagarin's mission and before an American had made orbit, Kennedy asked Congress to fund the landing on the moon. 
This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. T-minus two hours, 30 minutes, 55 seconds and counting. Right on the hour, the uh, command module pilot, astronaut Michael Collins, who will be sitting on the right-hand side of the spacecraft during the liftoff, uh, boarded the spacecraft. We had it logged at 7 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. The third member of the crew, astronaut Buzz Aldrin, standing by in the elevator uh, around the corner along the swing arm uh, from the white room and the spacecraft at the 320-foot level. 120 feet below, technicians still working on some bolts that surround a leaking valve that is associated with a system that replenishes the hydrogen fuel supply for the third stage of the Saturn V rocket. Our countdown proceeding at this time, coming up toward the two minute and 30 minute mark, 30 second, the two hour and 30 minute mark in the count. This is Kennedy Launch Control. Project Apollo was already a plan waiting to happen. The massive F-1 engines that would power the first stage of the Saturn V rocket had been initially requested by the Air Force in 1955, when nuclear warheads were expected to be larger and missile structure was much heavier. With the advent of the lightweight Atlas rocket, more efficient engines, and miniaturization of warheads, however, the Air Force didn't need it anymore, but NASA became interested. The first static firing of an F-1 engine occurred in March of 1959, two years before JFK's change of heart. Werner von Braun, who had come up with a variety of space exploration plans over the decades, radically revised his vision to incorporate the engine, ultimately coming up with a series of Saturn rockets that included the Saturn C-5, now known as the Saturn V. The Saturn series was first proposed in October of 1958. So, when Kennedy set his goal of sending people to the surface of the moon and returning them to Earth safely by the end of the decade, that doesn't mean the work started at that point. In fact, a great deal of work had already been done, but it needed the funding to bring it to fruition. Lots of funding. It wasn't a matter of building one rocket that could go to the moon, but rather building a lot of rockets and spacecraft so that they could be tested, techniques of spaceflight, rendezvous, and spacewalks could be perfected, and information about space and the moon, including radiation exposure and other hazards, could be gathered. It was also about building all the infrastructure to assemble and launch the rockets. On May 25, 1961, about a month and a half after Gagarin's mission, John F. Kennedy addressed Congress to ask for the money. Vice President Lyndon Johnson had a big part to play in laying the groundwork with Congress and rallying support. The dramatic achievements in space which occurred in recent weeks should have made clear to us all, as did the Sputnik in 1957, the impact of this adventure on the minds of men everywhere who are attempting to make a determination of which road they should take. Since early in my term, our efforts in space have been under review. With the advice of the Vice President, who is Chairman of the National Space Council, we have examined where we are strong and where we are not, where we may succeed and where we may not. Now it is time to take longer strides, time for a great new American enterprise, time for this nation to take a clearly leading role in space achievement, which in many ways may hold the key to our future on Earth. I therefore ask the Congress, above and beyond the increases I have earlier requested for space activities, to provide the funds which are needed to meet the following national goals. First, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space, and none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. In conclusion, let me emphasize one point. It is not a pleasure for any President of the United States, as I'm sure it was not a pleasure for my predecessor, to come before the Congress and ask for new appropriations which place burdens on our people. I came uh, with, uh, to this conclusion uh, with some reluctance. But in my judgment, this is a most serious time in the life 
of our country and in the life of freedom around the globe. And it is the obligation, I believe, of the President of the United States to at least make his recommendations to the members of the Congress so that they can reach their own conclusions uh, with that uh, judgment before them. Having made the decision, John F. Kennedy took it seriously and showed active interest in the program, continuing to spur public support for it with his Rice University speech a year later on September 12, 1962. And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why, 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. But if I were to say, my fellow citizens, that we shall send to the moon 240,000 miles away from the control station in Houston, a giant rocket more than 300 feet tall, the length of this football field, made of new metal alloys, some of which have not yet been invented, capable of standing heat and stresses several times more than have ever been experienced, fitted together with a precision better than the finest watch, carrying all the equipment needed for propulsion, guidance, control, communications, food, and survival on an untried mission to an unknown celestial body, and then return it safely to Earth re-entering the atmosphere at speeds of over 25,000 miles per hour, causing heat about half that on the temperature of the sun, almost as hot as it is here today, and do all this, and do all this, and do it right, and do it first, before this decade is out, then we must be bold. This is Apollo Saturn launch control, T minus two hours, 23 minutes, 46 seconds, and counting. The third member of the Apollo 11 Prime crew now aboard the spacecraft. We had it logged at 7.07 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time when astronaut Buzz Aldrin boarded the spacecraft. He will sit in the middle seat uh, during liftoff. As lunar module pilot, his normal position uh, would be on the right-hand side. However, due to crew preference, uh, we have uh, the commander, of course, Neil Armstrong, sitting on the left-hand side, the lunar module pilot, for the overall flight, Buzz Aldrin sitting in the middle seat and the command module pilot, Mike Collins, uh, sitting in the right-hand seat at liftoff. Down below at the 200-foot level, our technicians still hard at work tightening bolts around uh, a valve associated with the system that replenishes the hydrogen fuel for the third stage of the Saturn V launch vehicle. This is ground support equipment located on the tower at the pad at the 200-foot level. He continues to work at the 200-foot level as the crew in the white room uh, does the same with the three astronauts aboard. We actually have a fourth astronaut still aboard the spacecraft at this time, astronaut Fred Hayes, who is the backup command module pilot. He is in the lower equipment bay of the spacecraft, giving a helping hand to the three prime crewmen as they uh, start to perform some of their preliminary checks here as we uh, head down over the final uh, two hours, uh, two and a half hours of the countdown. We're at T-minus two hours, 22 minutes, 11 seconds and counting. This is Kennedy Launch Control. Kennedy's Rice University speech was really clear about how much would have to go right and how difficult the task was. Given his recognition of the risks, he frequently thought that it would be better if the United States and the Soviet Union worked together on the mission and proposed that before the United Nations the following year. Soviet Premier Khrushchev decided against that cooperation. Khrushchev recognized what a boon the records his space program had continued to set were and that they were ahead of the Americans, so it would have been a surprise if he had agreed. It would only be after the Apollo missions, the lunar missions, with the United States showing that it had caught up that the joint Apollo-Soyuz mission between the two countries occurred. However, the Soviet Union had also not mobilized its own moon mission at the time of Kennedy's offer because of internal bureaucratic struggles. Soviet chief designer Sergei Korolev had started designing the N-1 moon rocket in 1961, but he couldn't get backing for it until 1964. Korolev had faced resistance at every step, with Sputnik, Luna, and Vostok as well. 
This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. We've just passed the two-hour, 21-minute mark in our countdown, and we are proceeding at this time. At the 320-foot level, all three astronauts now aboard the spacecraft. Just a few minutes ago, astronaut Buzz Aldrin came in and took the center seat to join uh, Neil Armstrong on the left and Mike Collins on the right. These are the positions they will fly at liftoff. Uh, during the process of getting the astronauts checked into the spacecraft, communication cables must be attached to their suits. They also have to hook into the suit circuit system of the spacecraft that brings oxygen into their suits. They are helped by a fourth astronaut on board. The backup command module pilot, astronaut Fred Hayes, is in the lower equipment bay, and one of the suit technicians who's located behind them to give a hand as they check in. We've heard from Neil Armstrong, and now we've also heard from Mike Collins on comm checks, and we're standing by for further reports as the checkout continues. 120 feet down, the work continues on a leaky valve at the 200-foot level. Uh, this is ground support equipment. The technician still hard at work tightening bolts around that valve at this time. Two hours, 19 minutes, 45 seconds and counting. This is Kennedy Launch Control. Kennedy and later Johnson made the Apollo program a singular entity that a major part of America's manufacturing and technological development would be focused on through the 1960s. After Kennedy died and Vice President Johnson took over, the resolve to back Apollo could not have been stronger. At its peak in 1966, NASA received $43 billion in 2014 dollars, about $6 billion at the time, for a share of about 4.4% of the federal budget. Today, NASA receives an eighth of that percentage of the federal budget, 0.5%, and less than half the absolute dollars, around $15 billion in 2014 dollars. In constant dollar terms, NASA's budget has basically been stagnant since the Nixon administration, around 1971. There has been enough to fund robust robotic missions to other planets, Voyager, Cassini, Curiosity, New Horizons, and the like, but it has kept astronauts in low Earth orbit. So, if anyone wonders why we haven't returned to the moon, the answer is money. And behind the lack of money is that there has been no reason to supply the money. No technological or political threat posed by another nation in the same way the Soviet Union was perceived to pose in the 1950s and 1960s. Kennedy's part, along with Lyndon Johnson, was in getting the money to get the job done. Many presidents have since made speeches sending NASA on one path or another, back to the moon or on to Mars, but none have been able to properly fund the project. We've already been introduced to the next character in our drama, the Saturn V rocket that would get astronauts Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins to the moon. To understand this behemoth, weighing in at over 2,800 tons, we first have to understand how rockets work. Rockets take advantage of conservation of momentum and Newton's third law, which basically states that if you shoot something in one direction, you get a force in the opposite direction, an equal and opposite reaction. This can be seen by the recoil of a gun when a bullet is fired, for instance, but instead of a sudden impulse like a bullet, a rocket constantly shoots out tons of exhaust. It's more like a balloon with a small puncture. Most of the Saturn V's 2,800 tons is propellant, propellant tanks, and engines, with only 45 tons actually being sent on a trajectory to the moon. The efficiency of a rocket engine depends on how fast its exhaust goes, because that determines how fast the payload is propelled in the opposite direction. On the first stage, that propellant is shot out the back at around 3,000 meters per second, or 6,700 miles an hour. The second and third stages are more efficient, but not powerful enough to fight actively against gravity the way the first stage has to, and their exhaust goes at around 4,200 meters per second, or nearly 9,400 miles an hour. The way conservation of momentum works, if you shoot 100 tons of material at 9,000 miles an hour in one direction, then you can move another 100 tons at 9,000 miles an hour in the opposite direction. It's really important to understand that, unlike on the surface of the Earth, there is a near complete lack of friction and drag in space. So the Saturn V would like to get itself to space as soon as possible, and do most of its acceleration there. Because of the lack of friction and drag, you don't need to keep accelerating to maintain your path to a destination, the way you have to on a road trip on the ground. That means that once the Saturn V has put the Apollo spacecraft on a path to the moon, the spacecraft doesn't need to do anything to get there, 
except minor corrections. It doesn't burn fuel all along the way as we do when traveling in the presence of contact with the ground and air. Fortunately, it doesn't take very long to get to space. The air gets thin enough that we can't breathe anymore by the altitude airliners fly at, around 33,000 feet or 10 kilometers in altitude. The Saturn V gets to that point in about a minute, and it has already started to turn horizontal to cease fighting against gravity and work with it instead. You might wonder during launch why the Saturn V just doesn't point straight up all the way. The fact is, the only reason it goes up in the first place is to get out of the drag of the atmosphere. The technical border of space is 100 kilometers or 62 miles up, by which time the atmosphere is extremely thin, though there is still some drag. But that's tiny compared to the girth of the world, which is about 6,370 kilometers or 3,960 miles in radius. What the Saturn V seeks to do is to stop fighting gravity as soon as possible by going fast enough horizontally that the curve of the Earth drops away just as fast as gravity is pulling the spacecraft down. It's aiming for a straight line path, but thanks to gravity, ends up in a loop around the Earth known as an orbit. In this orbit, it hasn't lost any of that horizontal speed, about 7.8 kilometers per second, or 17,400 miles an hour, because gravity only affects its vertical speed. Could a rocket point straight up and try to get to the moon? Yes, but it would be fighting against gravity all the way, and that wouldn't be as efficient. Earth's gravity is a phenomenal burden to spaceflight, Consider that while it takes 7.8 kilometers per second to make orbit, it only takes 3.2 kilometers per second more to get to the moon. That's not to say that gravity won't be fighting you on that trip. The moon is still in Earth's gravity well, and since your path to it is not tangent to the ground anymore, all along the way the spacecraft is slowing down. When initially put on its path to the moon, the Apollo spacecraft will be going at about 11 kilometers per second. But by the time it gets to the point where the moon's gravity is dominant, that will have dropped to only a few hundreds of meters per second, a few hundred miles an hour, losing more than 95% of its velocity because of Earth constantly trying to pull it back. As a result, the mission speeds right through the radiation belts, and most of the three-day transit time is spent fairly close to the Moon, approaching really slowly compared to its speed close to the Earth and through the Van Allen belts. In fact, Apollo 11 was placed on what's called a free return trajectory, meaning that it would pass by the Moon in such a way that if anything were to go wrong, it would automatically be flung back to Earth. That's not hard because, as I said, Earth has been trying to bring it back the whole time. However, it is also possible to use the Moon's gravity to boost the spacecraft and finally break free of Earth's gravity, reaching escape velocity, which is the speed at which the Earth's gravity can no longer pull something back and the spacecraft would end up in orbit around the Sun. Escape velocity is only a bit more than what we need to get to the Moon, a couple of hundred meters per second or miles an hour, but since we're only trying to get to the moon, we don't want that extra bit of speed. Actually, if in orbit you were to accelerate the craft to another 7.8 kilometers per second, double the orbital velocity, that would be enough to get you all the way to Saturn. Because travel on the ground works so differently from travel in space, it's often hard to wrap one's head around the way things work up there. Because things in space don't need to burn fuel in order to keep going the way they have been, it doesn't make sense to talk about a vehicle's range. To get from one place to another in space though, you need to change your orbit. When the Saturn V takes astronauts to the moon, it will first get them into a low Earth orbit, and then change that orbit into one that intersects the moon. To do that takes a change in velocity, so a space vehicle's capability is not measured in a distance, like a 300 mile range, but rather how much it can change its velocity, a number often stated as delta v. Delta is the symbol for a change in something, and v stands for the velocity. In the Apollo tapes you will also hear delta p, which means a change in pressure. Anywhere you want to go in space, there's a definite amount of velocity change that it will take to get there, and the moon takes 3,100 to 3,200 meters per second from low Earth orbit, depending on how fast you want to get there, Making a tight orbit around the moon takes another 800 meters per second. A normal landing on the moon takes 2,000 meters per second, though the lunar module has a descent budget of 2,600 or so, depending on its load. So by seeing what each phase of the mission will take, you can get a delta V budget that dictates the way the spacecraft are designed and how much propellant each stage will carry. It doesn't make sense to carry more propellant in the lunar module because it already has substantial margin for landing, and the rest would not only be wasted, 
but also mean everything else, including the entire Saturn V rocket, would have to be heavier. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control, T-minus 2 hours, 10 minutes, 35 seconds, and counting. At the 324th level, the fourth astronaut aboard the spacecraft regretfully leaves at this time. Astronaut Fred Hayes is about to come out after giving the three prime crewmen a hand in their preliminary checkouts aboard. Fred Hayes will be coming out shortly. In the meantime, 120 feet below where we had that problem with a leaky valve, the technicians have completed their work and they are in the process now of departing from the launch pad. In a short while, we'll start flowing hydrogen again back uh, through the general replenishing system to, to uh, continue to top off the supply of the hydrogen fuel in the third stage of the Saturn V launch vehicle. The spacecraft commander, Neil Armstrong, has completed a series of checks uh, called the board advisory system checks. This is where certain key crewmen on the ground, members of the launch team, can uh, send signals uh, to the spacecraft commander in the spacecraft, C light cues that would indicate uh, difficulty during the flight in which he could take aboard action if he uh, de determined that such action was necessary. These checks have been completed and Neil Armstrong confirmed that the lights came on in the console in front of him, the panel in front of him, as uh, these lights were uh, operated from the ground here in the launch control center. All still going well with our count. Uh, we will stand by as we uh, again uh, bring hydrogen back to the third stage. You will see how that operates. We're now at T minus two hours, nine minutes, four seconds and counting. And this is Kennedy Launch Control. A bit of an aside, since we're currently seeing the pad crew prepare the command module for the closure of the hatch, the command module is the conical spacecraft that the astronauts launch in and will eventually come back to Earth in. It has a heat shield at the bottom of it because they will be using drag from the atmosphere to slow themselves down from 25,000 miles an hour to about 300, at which point it will be safe to deploy the parachute. But using atmospheric drag like that, while it saves on fuel, requires a lot of protection from re-entry heat. At the top of the command module is a launch escape tower that will pull the module away from the rest of the rocket if something goes wrong on the pad or in the first three minutes. After those three minutes, the escape tower will be jettisoned using its solid rockets to fly off, at which point the spacecraft's windows will finally be uncovered. The command module is four meters or 13 feet in diameter. If it sounds rough staying in space like that for around eight days, remember that all these astronauts have previously been launched in the Gemini spacecraft, which is basically like the front seats in a small car. There are two reasons why a smaller volume is more acceptable in space than on the ground. First, you can actually use all of it because nothing is tying you to the floor. The spacecraft seems a bit more roomy when you can look at it from all sorts of new angles as you float around in weightlessness. Second, without anything pushing back on you like the ground or your seat, exerting pressure on your body, you don't get aches. So you can be perfectly comfortable staying still. That said, it was still probably a relief to return to the surface and enjoy the sheer vastness of the world. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control, T minus two hours, seven minutes and counting. At this time, we're just in the process of closing the hatch on the Apollo 11 spacecraft. Uh, several of the closeout crew shook hands with the astronauts and then proceeded to close the hatch on direction from the spacecraft test conductor, Skip Chauvin. We had it logged as the hatch being closed and tightened, uh, still being tightened right at this time, which is 25 minutes past the hour. Once the hatch is closed, uh, we will start a cabin purge to condition uh, the cabin inside. The three astronauts, of course, are on pure oxygen in their spacesuits on the suit circuit. We will uh, produce a cabin atmosphere in the spacecraft of a 60-40 combination, 60% oxygen and 40% nitrogen. This is the atmosphere used uh, for liftoff. Once that is accomplished, the closeout crew will be ready to put the boost protective cover uh, on the hatch and continue with their closeout. 
the hatch being closed at this time, we are proceeding. We'll stand by to see uh, uh, how our hydrogen condition is as far as replenishing the hydrogen fuel supply with the third stage of the Saturn V. Two hours, five minutes, 50 seconds and counting. This is Kennedy Launch Control. Back to Saturn V, let's try to understand what we'll be seeing during the launch. The rocket is built with three stages so that I can dump the extra mass of tanks and use smaller, more efficient engines when fighting against gravity is no longer necessary. Responsibility for the construction of the rocket was spread throughout U.S. industry. The first stage, assembled by Boeing, is called the S-1C, and it makes up most of the mass of the launcher. Around 2,300 metric tons of the total 2,800 to 3,000 tons depending on which mission we're talking about. Of that, 131 tons is dry mass and the other nearly 2,200 tons is a high-grade kerosene fuel called RP-1 and liquid oxygen as the oxidizer. Because the rocket can't breathe air like a jet engine or a car engine as it quickly reaches altitudes where air will not be available, it has to carry its own oxidizer. That unfortunately adds a lot to the mass. The stage features five Rocketdyne F1 engines, which could each provide 1.522 million pounds of thrust at sea level. That is, each engine could cause a 1.522 million pound, or 690 metric ton, mass to hover over the ground, or it could lift up slightly less than that. It is the most powerful single liquid fuel combustion chamber ever flown, the Soviet Union did develop a more powerful liquid fuel engine later on for their Energia rocket called the RD-170, but that engine has four combustion chambers sharing a turbo pump. With five F-1 engines, the S-1C stage had a total of about 7.6 million pounds of thrust, or 3,450 metric tons worth, which is enough to lift the 6.5 million pound mass of the Saturn V rocket. As mentioned before, F-1 engine development began all the way back in 1955 when the Air Force felt it might need an engine of this size since early rockets were structurally heavy and early payloads were not well optimized. Parts of the engine had been tested starting in 1957 and a full F-1 engine was first test fired in 1959. NASA received its first fully developed F-1 engine in 1963 and it was flight rated by the end of 1964. But the F-1 engine couldn't do the job alone. If the upper stage engines also used the moderately efficient kerosene and oxygen propellant combination that the F-1 did, the rocket would not get as much into space. This was one of the many problems with the Soviet N-1 rocket once the Soviet Union finally committed to a crewed moon mission in 1964. It was using kerosene and oxygen in all stages. As a result, the N-1 rocket could only aim to land one person on the moon and had to use a very trim lander to do so. What allowed the Saturn V to land two astronauts and later missions a rover was the use of liquid hydrogen as the fuel in the second and third stage. Now liquid oxygen is already tough to handle and to build tanks for. Since its boiling pressure is negative 183 degrees Celsius or negative 297 degrees Fahrenheit. Even with good tanks, there's some boil off. So you'll see a rocket filled with liquid oxygen produce a vapor on the launch pad as it releases the oxygen that has boiled off. It replenishes that lost oxygen using propellant feed lines all the way until launch when those lines are severed. Liquid hydrogen is worse. Its boiling point is negative 252.87 degrees Celsius, only 20.28 degrees above absolute zero. It is very difficult to store and boils off profusely, though it is handy for cooling the engine nozzles and combustion chambers, so it's passed through tubes along the engine to keep the structure of the engine cool while the interior of the engine is hot much hotter than the F1 engine gets because hydrogen and oxygen release a lot of energy when they combust. The product of that combustion is also lighter than with kerosene and oxygen, so it gets shot out the nozzle of the engine faster, which leads to better efficiency. That exhaust is in fact water, H2O, so that any hydrogen and oxygen engine creates a cloud when it runs. When they test hydrogen and oxygen engines, you get some rain in the downrange direction. The main exhaust from a kerosene and oxygen engine is carbon dioxide with a lot of water and other stuff mixed in. Overall, that's heavier than the water, so it gets shot out the back of the rocket slower.
This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. We're at T-minus two hours, 55 seconds and counting. We're approaching the two-hour mark in our countdown, and we appear to be proceeding satisfactorily at this time. The crew aboard the spacecraft, the 320-foot level, the hatch is closed, and we're beginning to purge the ca cabin to bring it to the uh, proper atmosphere for launch, which is a combination of oxygen and nitrogen, 60% oxygen and 40% nitrogen atmosphere. Of course, the astronauts themselves are breathing pure oxygen through their spacesuits. Coming up shortly will be another key test in which both the... Uh, launch crew for the the launch vehicle crew and the spacecraft team uh, combined together with uh, the commander neil armstrong to make a thorough check of the emergency detection system this is the system that will signal the astronauts in the cabin if anything goes wrong below them we use the ground-based computer to accomplish this test it's rather lengthy as these tests go uh, using a computer it will take some 30 minutes Neil Armstrong will be no doing most of the work in the spacecraft, responding as different cue lights uh, signifying different uh, difficulties are presented to him. The abort uh, panel, of course, is across from the commander on the left-hand side, the left front of the spacecraft. Our countdown continuing, T-minus one hour, 59 minutes, 34 seconds, and counting. This is Kennedy Launch Control. Continuing with the Saturn V, the second stage is called the S-2. It was built by North American Aviation, and it features five Rocketdyne J-2 engines, which burn hydrogen and oxygen. At the end of the first stage, the rocket has enough momentum to coast upward for another 1 minute and 40 seconds before starting to fall to the ground, so the S-2 has some time available to it and doesn't start with enough thrust to fight against gravity directly. It takes advantage of the time given it by the first stage, and by the time it has reached its peak, it's already at the target orbit height of about 180 to 200 kilometers, or around 100 nautical miles. Instead of using most of its thrust to fight against gravity, it just uses a little pitch to remain at the height to give it more time to finish adding horizontal velocity. Its goal is to accelerate the payload and third stage by about 4,500 meters per second, or about 10,000 miles an hour. After doing so, it hands off to the third stage, which finishes orbit and then sends the astronauts to the moon. Being a much more sophisticated technology, the J-2s started development well after the F-1s, starting in 1960. However, this was still well before JFK set his goal to reach the moon by the end of the decade. This second stage was the most troublesome part of the rocket, though. On the Apollo 6 uncrewed test, two of its engines shut down prematurely because of vibrations breaking a fuel line to an igniter. That mission still made it to orbit with the remaining engines. You will notice during the launch that both the first stage and the second stage shut down the center engine partway into the burn. For the first stage, it is to limit g-forces on the crew, which experience up to four times the force of gravity on them due to acceleration. That's considered the limit if you want the crew capable of moving their limbs to access controls. On the second stage though, the reason the center engine shuts down is to avoid excessive vibrations. Even with this preventative measure though, on Apollo 13 the oscillations were strong enough that the computer had to shut down the center engine early. The thrust frame the engines were attached to was being warped and the whole stage was threatening to rip apart. Apollo 13 avoided disaster during the launch thanks to that timely engine shutdown on the second stage, though they would eventually face another accident later into the mission that forced a return without a lunar landing. The third stage had just one of the J-2 engines that the second stage had five of, and by all accounts it was a very smooth stage by comparison. Known as the S-4B and built by Douglas Aircraft Company, it was also the only stage that had been tested on a different rocket first, flying in a slightly modified form on the much smaller Saturn 1B rocket as its second stage. The Saturn 1B was used for low Earth orbit tests of the equipment that the Saturn V would later send all the way to the moon, and it did so with the crew on board during Apollo 7 and Apollo 9. This little brother of Saturn V was also used to bring astronauts to the Skylab space station in 1973. The S-4B stage on Saturn V, weighing in at 115 tons, is responsible for completing orbit around the Earth, and then relighting to transfer the Apollo spacecraft to the Moon. Its first burn takes about two and a half minutes, and then the translunar injection, TLI, burn takes about five to six minutes. 
Transit to the moon involves an additional 3,200 meters per second or 7,000 miles an hour of velocity. If something goes wrong with the second stage, it's possible to use the extra fuel from the third stage to bring the crew safely to orbit around the Earth. But if it uses too much, then going to the moon would be out of the picture. At the point where that starts to be possible, the crew will be told that they have S-4B to orbit capability. Only Apollo 13 ultimately faced this situation, and in that case only a little bit of extra effort from the S-4B had been necessary. At the top of the third stage is a ring containing the computers, telemetry equipment, accelerometers, and inertial platform that control the rocket. This is the Saturn instrument unit put together by IBM, and because it was a structural element of the rocket, and bears the payload on top of it, it weighed in at a whopping 2 tons. It's the final element of the Saturn V launcher proper, everything above it is the payload that it is trying to send to the moon. The instrument unit was separate from the computers in the command module and lunar module, so the crew had little interaction with the workings of the Saturn V. They were just along for the ride until they were delivered to orbit. The rocket was designed by Werner von Braun, who had been brought to the United States from Germany after World War II, along with hundreds of other German engineers who had worked on the V-2 rocket program during the war. Von Braun had led that destructive program, causing countless deaths in both Britain, as well as in Germany where the working conditions in the rocket factories had been deliberately atrocious. He had been a member of the Nazi party, but insisted when questioned by US officials that he had only joined to continue his rocket work. To be sure, he didn't seem devoted to any political views or anything beyond a single-minded determination to send humans into space and to the moon, a project he was dreaming of since his student days in the early 1930s. He had actually been imprisoned by the SS briefly during the war under false charges of communist sympathies that he was eventually cleared of, so apparently even the Nazi government wasn't totally sure of his loyalty. Officials in the United States were by no means quick to take advantage of von Braun's expertise, however. They wanted to know about the V-2, but didn't care about his other designs, plans, or to involve him in ballistic missile development. The press was not kind to the former Nazi engineers either, but von Braun decided to submit his vision of humanity's future in space to Collier's Weekly, and that sparked public interest. He also published a book called The Mars Project in 1952, and became an advisor to a Disney feature called Man in Space in 1955. It took a decade for von Braun to gain some level of acceptance. Thanks to his rocket work at Redstone Arsenal, he had modified his V-2 into the Redstone rocket, and a variant of it was ready to deliver America's first satellite, Explorer 1, into orbit. There were many reasons why President Eisenhower might have balked at allowing von Braun's rocket to be the one to score this achievement, but high on that list had to have been the former general's memory of the war and this taste of having the first US satellite be launched on a modified Nazi vengeance rocket. So von Braun was told to wait as the Navy used its own very different rocket, the Vanguard, to make an attempt. Only when that failed spectacularly was von Braun allowed to proceed. When Kennedy set the goal for the United States to land an astronaut on the moon though, there was little question that von Braun had to be involved. He was the man with the plan, and the entire public knew it. It is interesting that the two rockets used for the Apollo project, the Saturn 1B and the Saturn V, were the only two large American rockets at the time that were not designed for military applications. The rest, the Thor, the Atlas, and the Titan, were all born as ballistic missiles. The same was true on the Soviet side as well. Their moon rocket, the N-1, was their first large rocket to have no military purpose at all. In a way, the space race diverted funds and energy that would have been devoted to military projects and helped cool Cold War tensions. The United States started looking more respectfully at the Soviet Union because of Sputnik and Vostok, and a dialogue began that saw cosmonauts lauded in the United States, American astronauts celebrated in the Soviet Union, and ultimately the joint Apollo-Soyuz program take place. Did von Braun redeem himself with the Apollo program after his Nazi past? There's no easy moral calculus with which to answer that question. The Saturn V was not the only aerospace technology to bear the legacy of German technology taken by the United States during World War II, though. Rather, the engineers and equipment brought over ended up involved in every facet of the U.S. aerospace industry and its substantial post-war successes.
This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control, T-minus one hour, 50 minutes, 55 seconds and counting. We're proceeding with the countdown for the Apollo 11 mission at this time, and it's going satisfactorily. At this point, the spacecraft commander, Neil Armstrong, in the process of uh, working the emergency detection system test. This is a check of the emergency detection system, uh, working with the launch crew here in the firing room, and also the spacecraft team in uh, control rooms back at the Manned Spacecraft Operations Building here at the Kennedy Space Center. All going well with these tests at the present time. We're flowing hydrogen back into the third stage of the Saturn V launch vehicle after having difficulty with that leaking valve. It appears that we are bypassing the use of the valve directly in loading the hydrogen aboard, but we are getting the hydrogen back in to replenish the supply. All appears to be going well at this time. Weather is go. We're coming up on one hour and 50 minutes. This is Kennedy Launch Control. To wrap up this hour, I would like to talk a bit more about the payload, the 45 or so tons that will actually be sent to the moon, and then in the next hour leading up to the launch, we will talk about and hear from the three astronauts. As impressive as the Saturn V is as a technological accomplishment, it was nothing without its payloads, and those were as expensive to develop and build as the rocket itself. Just above the Saturn instrument unit, we find the lunar module, also called the LEM, tucked away in a fairing underneath the other major part of the mission, the Apollo Command and Service Module. The pointy bit at the top of the rocket is the launch escape system, which will be jettisoned around three minutes into the launch. It's really only meant to pull the command module away from the rest of the rocket if something horrible happens on the launch pad or early into the launch, and has special high thrust solid motors to do that. The command module is where the astronauts sit for launch and where they will stay for the trip to the moon and back. Only when making the landing will two astronauts, Commander Neil Armstrong and Lunar Module Pilot Buzz Aldrin in this case, transfer to the LEM while the remaining astronaut, Command Module Pilot Michael Collins, stays in orbit around the moon with their Earth return ship. The command module is shaped as a cone so that when it slams back into Earth's atmosphere during the return, it will be properly protected by its heat shield and can generate some lift to reduce the harshness of the deceleration on the way back. On the side of the command module is an umbilical that wraps around the heat shield to connect to the service module, which contains the fuel cells to generate power and the water supply partly produced by the fuel cells. It has hydrogen and oxygen tanks for the fuel cells and to provide breathing oxygen. On its own, the command module only has batteries and can't provide its own power for more than a few hours, so the service module is necessary to keep the command module fully powered for the trip to the moon and back. That's why on Apollo 13, when the service module was damaged by a rupture in an oxygen tank, they had to power down the command module and rely on the lunar module for life support to get them back home safely. That oxygen tank failure was due to mishandling prior to the mission, and fortunately there were no such problems with the Apollo 11 tanks. Though that's not to say the astronauts didn't keep a close eye on these very vital systems. The service module also contains a service propulsion system, one of the most reliable rocket engines ever designed, and its propellants. The Service Propulsion System, or SPS, has to get the astronauts into orbit around the moon and then relight to return them back to Earth, so it was kept both as simple as possible to reduce points of failure and was also replete with redundancies. It was capable of restarting around 40 times, even though it would only need to light a handful of times for a normal moon mission, and while its typical maximum rated burn time for a single burn was 8 minutes, it was tested for up to 30 continuously. Unlike the engines on the Saturn V rocket, which used complex turbo pumps prone to wear and tear to quickly get propellants into the engine to produce a lot of thrust, the SBS was a pressure-fed engine without a turbo pump. It used the pressure of helium gas to push its propellants into the engine to minimize moving parts. The downside to that is that you can't make a very powerful pressure-fed engine without making it obscenely large. The SPS was actually taller and wider than the J2 engine used on the second and third stage of the Saturn V rocket, but it produced only a tenth of the thrust, and that was because its chamber pressure was much less than that of a J2 due to lack of turbo pumps. During the audio, after a burn with the SPS, you'll hear the astronauts discuss with Mission Control the pressure in the SPS to see how the engine is holding up. This critical engine would also use a different fuel and oxidizer than the Saturn V, 
instead of kerosene and oxygen or hydrogen and oxygen, it used storable propellants that wouldn't boil off and would ignite on contact with each other. These were aerosene 50 and nitrogen tetroxide. They weren't as efficient as the fuels on the Saturn V, but for long space missions they were more reliable. A major downside was that they were extremely toxic, but they had been in use for a while, notably in the Titan rocket that launched the Gemini spacecraft, so the space program had solid experience in handling them safely. The same propellant combination is also used in the lunar module for the same reason, storage and ease of ignition. Along with the main engine, the service module also has four blocks of four small thrusters on each side, known as the RCS, the Reaction Control System. These can turn the craft and are used for minor adjustments when lighting the SPS would be overkill. They are used to rotate the craft for passive thermal control, or PTC, which you will hear a lot about in the audio, which is a barbecue roll at a rate of three revolutions per hour, which changes what part of the spacecraft faces the sun so that things don't overheat. The little thrusters are also necessary for docking with the LEM. Once the S-4B puts Apollo 11 on a trajectory to the moon, the command and service modules, CSM for short, will separate from everything else and dock with the lunar module, which will still be attached to the spent third stage of the Saturn V rocket. For this maneuver, only the RCS thrusters will be used. We will see a video of this docking when it occurs three hours into the mission. In a way, the lunar module is similar to the CSM in that it comes in two parts, but with the LEM, both parts have engines. The top part contains the crew and also the ascent stage, the tanks, more RCS thrusters, and the lunar module ascent engine, which will bring the crew back from the surface of the moon to a rendezvous with the CSM, which will wait in orbit. The lunar module ascent engine is even simpler than the service propulsion system. It isn't really meant to fire more than once, but it has to very definitely do that or the crew will be stranded on the surface of the moon. It also had to be more compact than the big engine on the service module. Below that ascent module with the crew riding in it is the golden foil covered descent stage, which has the ladder, landing legs, and the lunar module descent engine, or LEMD. The descent engine is actually more complicated than either its little brother on the ascent stage or the SPS. Not only can it restart a few times, but it can throttle down to 10% of its full thrust, a capability none of the other engines mentioned have. In fact, of all the other engines, only the J2 can throttle at all, and in that case only by a bit by a change in fuel mixture, and not nearly to the extent of the descent engine. The descent engine had to be able to do this to allow the astronauts and the lunar module computer to manage descent carefully. It basically allows the LEM to hover for a bit and adjust for the fact that it's constantly getting lighter as fuel gets used. Throttling rocket engines is much more complicated than throttling a car engine though, and few are designed to do it. That gold foil on the descent stage is multi-layer thermal insulation, by the way, and is actually Captain, an aluminized foil packed into a bunch of layers to protect the components from the wildly varying temperatures they would experience in space. It and its mylar alternative are still in use on satellites and space probes today. With that, we're approaching the end of our first hour of coverage. The next video will feature details about the astronauts and also a T-2 days interview with them as we count down from T-1 hour and 41 minutes. The video after that will contain the actual launch, and my own narration will substantially diminish as I'll have introduced what I wanted to introduce, and the voices of the PAO, Capcom, and the astronauts will be our main focus. The videos will not all be the same length, that will depend on what's going on, as I don't want to interrupt critical parts of the mission, and, of course, slower parts of the mission will be lumped together in longer videos as well. Thank you for watching the Rays Aerospace commemoration of the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11.